Hey everybody, this is your daily dose of all things royal. Carry out um, the right engagements, carry out our work and try and encourage others and the younger generation to be able to see the, the world in the, in the correct sense rather than um, perhaps being dis having a, a distorted view. Welcome back, my gorgeous, good-looking friends. Once again, I was sucked down the rabbit hole and just now coming back up for air and want to present you some information that I have been chewing on over the last couple of days. So a big shout out to Skippy on Tumblr, who has helped me fill in a couple of gaps with this whole circus that we have been witnessing. My honest assessment right now is that this is the biggest con of the century. From the very beginning, this was a sham to the world. And like many of us, back in 2016, no one was paying attention to what these two yahoos were doing. In fact, in the United States, no one knew who Meghan Markle was. And at the time when it was leaked that Meghan was dating the so-called prince, in the United States, we could care less because at that moment, we were dealing with an election, an election between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Now, we all know that Everything that Meghan Markle has done has been strategic and with purpose. So I don't think that it was any rush job for her to leak that she was dating Prince Harry at the time that she did. This was right before an election. And here we have now this uber feminist who was very into female empowerment and worshiped Hillary Clinton. Now we all know that the Clintons love celebrity and they understand the power of celebrity. So what better way than to have Meghan come onto the scene in such a global capacity being tied to the royal family now, which gave Hillary a bigger boost globally with connecting with the younger generation, which was one of the issues that she was having because people just didn't like her. Well, anyhow, Megan, being a supporter of Hillary and in the past has talked about how she looked up to Hillary and wrote to her when she was 11 years old for this P&G campaign, which was all a lie. You start to now look back and say, hmm, this all seems quite suspicious on how all these pieces fell together in such an awkward and unexplainable way. Prior to the 2016 election, Meghan was vocal about Trump being misogynistic. And, you know, this post that came out of nowhere before anyone knew that she was dating Prince Harry about Brexit just seemed so random at the time. But now it's starting to make a lot of sense. Now, we all know that Meghan doesn't do things just for the heck of it. There was a reason for her to post this. And at the time, she was seen as this budding influencer. So is it possible that she got paid by someone from a political party to post this? Yeah, that is possible. Now, keep in mind that this was before anyone knew that Meghan had any ties to Europe and Prince Harry. So posting this made zero sense as to why she would inject her opinion in here on this matter, which now as we see what has developed over the last six years, you start to realize that this is part of the globalist agenda. We know as fact that Meghan was on board as she supported One Young World as well as UN and UN Women. So getting back to when it was leaked that Meghan was dating Prince Harry on October 30th, eight days later, Harry then goes ahead and issues out a statement from Kensington Palace. Folks, I don't know about you, but I don't believe in coincidences on timing and purpose. This letter that was issued by the communications secretary came out on election day, November 8th, talking about misogyny and sexism of Meghan Markle. Do I think that that was a coincidence in the fact that the attacks on Donald Trump were exactly about that? From day one, Megan used the race card. I don't think that that was by accident. And to have this statement fully prepared after a couple days of exposing to the world that they had been dating, no, I don't buy it. In addition, Hillary Clinton attacked Donald Trump for these exact same things, the sexism, the racism of his voters, the deplorables, right? Then you had her basis of, oh, all the social media Russian trolls, which ended up being exposed as a lie. This was all part of the attack campaign that Hillary Clinton used in running for president. And after Hillary Clinton lost, she just couldn't get over and still can't get over the fact that people just didn't like her. And because she was a liar, just like Meghan Markle. 
Yeah, I'm starting to believe that this relationship was never meant to get to the altar. I believe this was to prove a point to be used on a temporary basis. But we all know that Megan had other ideas and she was not going to let that go. Megan had very powerful people helping her get her to the altar. I think Obama played a big role in getting Harry trapped to go along with this insane plan of marrying this woman. Donald Trump winning in 2016 put a wrench in all the globalist plans for what they have been trying to do, which is get to this ultimate control and power under this one world government. But wait, I know you're thinking, oh, this is getting too conspiracy theory for me. I'm going to log off. No, before you do that, I want you to hear from the horse's mouth back in 2017, Klaus Schwab talking about the threats that our new administration was having on their plan. We face a backlash of millions of people, particularly in the West, who feels that globalization is not working at their advantage. And for this reason, what we have seen in the elections, in the United States, in the Brexit vote, this anger of people against globalization and against the elites, which they feel have profited from globalization. Let me just pause there for a second. Who made the most money out of the pandemic? It was these elites. 25 people from the WEF ranked in over a couple trillion dollars. Trillion with a T. Despite the chaos that these people were creating, the United States economy was doing really well until we got hit with this horrible virus. We know we are in a very emotionalized way. So there's an emotional turmoil in the world. People in some parts of the world are angry. Facts do not anymore count. Fake news may become more important than realities. So how do we address this situation? Let me propose those nine to 10 dimensions. The first one is, we should not go back just to the old system of neoliberalism, and to say we want to fix the system by making it more inclusive. You just heard it, folks. He says we shouldn't go back to the old system of neoliberalism. And what neoliberalism means, it's a political approach that favors free market capitalism, deregulation, and reduction in government spending. We should not go back just to the old system of neoliberalism, and to say we want to fix the system by making it more inclusive. No, we don't want to make it more inclusive so everyone can thrive. No. If you look what's happening in the United States, particularly, you have this anti-system movement. What we are seeing is a revolution against the system. So fixing the present system is not enough. Now, there is, of course, a anti-system, which is called libertarianism. So this anti-system that Klaus is talking about is a political philosophy that upholds liberty as a core value, freedom. Libertarians seek to maximize autonomy and political freedom, emphasizing equality before the law and civil rights to freedom of association, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, and freedom of choice. This is not working for Klaus. Which means to tear down everything which creates some kind of influence of government into private lives. It's demantling the system, and we see certain elements of this now in the new U.S. administration. I find these people so frightening. Here he is at the World Summit. Remember, he's the head of the World Economic Forum. So the same people are hobnobbing in the circle, dictating what we can and cannot do. And as you can see, they are very threatened by the U.S. Constitution and our rights and have been trying to dismantle it. And that's because they don't want 
anyone to be free. In the foundation of the United States itself, in our Declaration of Independence, Every American citizen has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are unalienable rights that we are born with here that cannot be taken away, in which this is something that they are trying to dismantle. Our government was based off of the premise under God, and these are unalienable rights that all of us here are entitled to. They cannot be transferred or taken away no matter what government structure we're under. The United Nations, a non-government organization that is not elected by anybody, decides to put out their findings on December 7, 2023 of the United States Congressional Hearing Meetings. Here is their feedback that they want to give the United States in order to make tweaks and changes to get in alignment with what they're driving here. They go into talking about all the positive aspects of the executive orders that the Biden administration has been signing off on. And then they get into the improvements that we need to make. So they get into the principal matters of concerns and their recommendations. And this is all evolving around human rights. What I think here is the biggest manipulation of all of this is using human rights to take away people's inalienable rights, which for us here in the United States, freedom of speech would be considered that. Let me explain what the difference is so you can understand what is going on here and how they're doing it in a way that's so deceptive to the world. People need to wake up to understand the fundamental between human rights and inalienable rights, because I think the deception is making it appear that human rights is the same thing as inalienable rights. It's not. So I want to point something out here. In the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights that all states are under and are guided by, in the preamble is the only time they mention and talk about inalienable rights. So this declaration, or whatever you may call it, kicks off by saying, whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. Okay, so they're acknowledging it. They don't say that they respect it. Next, they say, whereas disregard and contempt for human rights have resulted in barbarous acts which have outraged the conscience of mankind and the advent of a world in which human beings shall enjoy freedom of speech and belief and freedom from fear and want has been proclaimed as the highest aspiration of the common people. Now, these sneaky bitches mention inalienable rights only once throughout this entire document. The rest of it, as far as how they define human rights, are created by certain human beings and are bestowed by those human beings upon other human beings. They are not inalienable God-given rights or anything close to that. And this is what people kind of don't understand or see. So in this system under the UN for human rights, human beings are not considered to have any inalienable rights. For as the UN would have it, and we heard Klaus kind of express himself that freedom is not a good thing, our alleged human rights can be observed only if we comply with the current legal order. That order is conditional and it is subject to constant change, which is what we're seeing here. And that WHO pandemic treaty that they're sliding under the radar those are designed to take away people's inalienable rights. Now, in context with what I'm trying to explain to you with that WHO pandemic treaty, should that disaster get passed through, understand that our alleged human rights, again, I reiterate, can be observed only if we comply with the current legal order. That order is conditional. And this is what we're seeing with this UN. So now when we go back to this document of observations that the UN made and recommendations that they gave to the United States to tweak, you can see here they're using the premise of human rights and violations and what they believe should be done with our legislation and recommendations. This all is to then take away people's inalienable rights. One of those inalienable rights is our freedom of speech and expression. And as you can see, this is a hot topic for the UN because they desperately need to control. As you can see here, they talk about hate crimes and hate speech and 
taking effective measures to prevent and publicly condemn hate speech, in particular hate speech by politicians and high-level officials. This is all directed towards to Trump. You see here they want legal and policy frameworks put in place, which does impede on our First Amendment. And then also going into how the FBI should be involved and mandating certain laws and enforcement on the people for whether it be violation of these so-called human rights. Now, here's the kicker, folks. If you're an American, you're going to want to perk up and listen very closely because a lot of us have fallen asleep at the wheel for this. In the gender equality section, and I can't believe that they had the audacity to do this, but they say the committee regrets the lack of an explicit guarantee in the Constitution against sex and gender based discrimination. The state party should redouble its efforts to guarantee protection against sex and gender based discrimination in its Constitution, including through initiatives such as the Equal Rights Amendment. The state party should consider ratifying the convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women and the optional protocol thereto. I'm sorry, but the UN has no business making suggestions that we alter and change our constitution to fit their framework. Do you see how dangerous all of this is? So they essentially want to make it a violation of civil rights should, let's say, you have a different belief in how gender is supposed to be looked at. So if you are religious and you believe in Christian values and believe that God created man and woman and not all these various different um, sexes that they have been trying to confuse people with, then you know what? You possibly could be in violation or, you know, they want to penalize people to having wrong think. This now bleeds into people's freedom of expression and freedom of thought, which are inalienable rights, which is the point that I'm trying to make here of the UN needing to be shut down and defunded. Now, I'd like for you to understand that UNESCO, which is a division of the United Nations, is trying to put together guidelines and a global structure to manage speech in the digital sphere. And as you can see here, they want to involve governments in having more of a regulatory hold here and responsibility in trying to maintain civil society. Now, you'll notice throughout this document, they keep referring to human rights, human rights, human rights. Again, as I said, it's not about maintaining our inalienable rights. It's about maintaining under their framework and their definition on what your rights are. To me, I find this absolutely disgusting. And just a fun fact for you, during the Trump administration, we pulled out of being a part of this. We stopped funding this. But Biden said, you know what, we need to get back into it so we can all be controlled. So now we're back into it. Only two presidents have vowed to not give any money to this division, and that was Reagan and Trump. So make what you want of that. But getting back to Harry and Meghan, knowing what we know about their associations with the UN and the WEF, as well as King Charles's relationship with the UN and the WEF, you then start to think about how did this lunatic get away with so much? with zero consequences. As I went back and looked at the events as they unfolded, when they first got engaged, you start to notice some strange things and questioning how did the queen allow this marriage to move forward, especially since it was based off of lies. Meghan had the right people around her to do this. So here is Katie Hopkins giving her assessment on the Rob Moore podcast. You know, it's like... Things people can believe in. One of the ways that you get a, a population to rip itself apart is remove things that people had faith in. So some people may have had faith in the church and we've seen how you know mm. our churches are now architects' offices, which really annoys me. And then the royal family. Now for young people, it may have been meaningless anyway. You may be anti-monarchist, but for a large tranche of the population, the royal family was something they were proud of and believed in and believe in. 
Mm. And another thing that gets ripped apart. Uh, I think Meghan Markle was a very useful way of kind of destroying that. Obviously, in a modern era, what's the relevance? So when you say a useful monarchy? way, are you implying she's some kind of plant? I don't know that a plant, I just know that she was very, very well trained, both as an actress, even though you may say she's a crap actor, but she was a very useful fool uh, for helping destroy one of the loveliest things, which was the relationship between the two brothers. Mm. Meghan Markle, when she went on her first date, this is from my time at Mail Online, when I had access to things, um, Meghan Markle on her first date with Prince Harry wore Princess Diana's perfume, which if you're like an emotive wow. person that Fuck. remembers things with smells and remembers safety or security or the smell of home, Meghan Markle smelt like, like, like his mother on the first date. So she came along. I, really? 100%. Why would you do that? To, because Prince Harry was helpless in needing his mother. He's always needed his mother. And it just so happened that instead he got the trailer trash with the same perfume. Could it have been a bit of psyops added in there? Yeah, I think so. And then my, my father's already had a, you know, a couple of... No, more than that. We've had... A handful of teas and meetings and, and all sorts of gatherings over, over at his place as well, so... And when I listen to this again, it just now sounds so strange to say that Harry and Meghan were having meetings with Prince Charles. It almost sounds quite professional and businesslike. Not so much, hey, I'm getting together to know my future father-in-law. But then again, this too could have been a lie. We do know that there were several lies that they told throughout this interview. And no interview is complete with Meghan without bringing up the topic of race. Some of that scrutiny, and you ended up making a very public statement about it, some of that scrutiny was centered around your ethnicity, mm. Meghan. When you realized that, what did you think? Of course, it's disheartening. You know, it's, it's, um, it's a shame that that is the climate. And at that time, the climate was Brexit and Trump. The other weird things that make no sense are the inconsistencies on when Meghan met various certain members of the family, particularly the Queen. In some respects, I think Meghan manipulated her way to force the hand of the Queen to give this approval. Because in one case, Meghan issues out a PR puff piece in Us magazine, putting in there that she met the Queen on September 3rd. But here, Tom Bauer writes that two weeks after the Invictus Games ended on October 12th, Harry introduced Meghan to the Queen in Buckingham Palace, not Balmoral, as stated in Us magazine. And it says here that the monarch formally approved her grandson's engagement. The 91-year-old had no choice. You know, I find this kind of hard to believe that the Queen was put in a position where she had no choice. I am sure that MI5, MI6 did deep background checks on this woman as well as her family. And what I find strange here is that the palace didn't correct this story or put their foot down in where Meghan essentially set up this PR stunt in making people believe here in the United States that Kensington Palace deployed protection of the crown to Doria on the very same day that they announced their engagement. I find that hard to believe that the crown would give Doria protection but not give Mr. Markle protection. I'm outside the home of Meghan Markle's mom, Doria Ragland, in Los Angeles, and private security is stationed in this SUV right out in front. They just handed us this statement on Kensington Palace stationery, and it expresses Meghan's parents' extreme joy over the announcement. Who would have thought that a representative from the royal family would have been sent all the way over here? It underscores just how dramatic and historic this engagement really is. And now looking back on this, knowing what we know about Meghan, do you honestly think that Kensington Palace would have sent someone like this to pass out flyers? <laughs> I mean, it, it, it all now looks ridiculous. And what's even more ridiculous is looking at the statement that was supposedly issued on behalf of Doria and Thomas. I think that Meghan created this and put it on Harry's letterhead and sent it out herself. This is not an official announcement that's registered anywhere in the royal log, as all press statements are supposed to be registered. 
I'd be curious to know if Doria and Thomas collaborated on this statement because it was given like immediately after it was announced that they were engaged, which I find so bizarre. You would think that it would have taken a little bit of time and they would have put out a statement on their own. The Middletons didn't get this honor. But anyhow, if you listen to it, you tell me if you think that Megan put this together. It says, on the announcement of their daughter Meghan Markle's engagement to His Royal Highness Prince Henry of Wales, Mr. Thomas Markle and Ms. Doria Raglan said, We are incredibly happy for Meghan and Harry. Our daughter has always been a kind and loving person. To see her union with Harry, who shares the same qualities, is a source of great joy for us parents. We wish them a lifetime of happiness and are very excited for their future together. Like, I find it bizarre in the statement that a parent would have to emphasize that their daughter has always been a kind and loving person. I mean, that should be a given, as opposed to, like, Harry wouldn't marry some cruel and heartless bitch, which he ended up doing. You know what I mean? Meghan could have very well have photoshopped the Kensington Palace logo with H's emblem on there. And then written the statement herself and had her PR push it out to American media because we wouldn't have known any better. But why didn't the palace correct this? There is no official statement in the royal directory with all the press statements of this particular statement. Hence the reason why I believe that Meghan did this herself and wrote it herself. Um, no, the family together have been absolutely, um, you know, solid support. And, mm-hmm. and my grandparents as well have been have been wonderful throughout this whole process and they've known for quite some time. So how they, how they haven't told anybody is, 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 is a, again, a miracle in itself. But um, Then if that was the case, why did the royal family treat Mr. Markle so differently to Doria? I would like to know why didn't they send some type of assistance or help? Or at least, you know, if Meghan said no, have someone without her knowing go check on him to make sure that he wasn't being bombarded and consumed with the media or at least giving him some type of guidance on what to expect or to help him come into the fold. But they did none of that. And what's even more shocking to me is you would have thought that at bare minimum, after this wedding, the queen or the institution, not even the queen, she could have just put her signature on it, sent out a get well card or say, hey, you know, Sorry that you couldn't make it to the wedding. Hope you're feeling better. I'd like to extend an invitation to Buckingham Palace since he missed his daughter's big day and missed out on the moment to walk his own daughter down the aisle. I think at bare minimum, a get well card should have been in order from the institution, even if it took other courtiers to write it up and then have the queen just scribble her signature on it. I think by doing absolutely nothing, in my opinion, was not very royal. I would have expected more. But then again, seeing how all these events unfolded so strangely and nothing ever made sense, it then makes me wonder, like, was this a real union of some sorts? And it's starting to look like to me that it wasn't. This was a business arrangement, in my opinion. And the reason why I say that, I think the plan was all along to leave the monarchy and to come here to the United States in order to influence our election, as well as participate in the censorship industrial complex. And I do believe that Barack Obama had sold Harry on this vision that he had And this is what we had seen over the last couple of years. When you look at now what's being exposed in the Twitter files, as well as the newly exposed CTIL on UK and US intelligence working together to create this framework on censorship and why it was happening at that time, then you start to understand what was at play in order to get Trump out and push Biden in. Here's Michael Schellenberger explaining Obama's involvement. Uh, Yeah, this is very shocking. This was a large trove of documents, a complete set of documents provided to us by a patriotic whistleblower who had access to them. They show that there was much more going on than we thought. It covers a period of time that we had not had a good picture of, which was 2019, 2020. The whistleblower also said that the leader of this uh, 
organization. It's sort of a supposedly grassroots organization. In truth, they were UK and US military contractors had started a censorship effort that they tried to hide as a cybersecurity program. They would they were they were partly doing cybersecurity and then they hid within it a censorship initiative. And we know that the person that was in charge of it according to the whistleblower, said that the idea had come out of the Obama White House in early 2017, before Obama left office, and the idea was not to have a repeat wow. of 2016. We now see other documents showing other government officials working for the government at the time, people working for FBI, people working for the Department of Homeland Security, that were doing the censorship initiative, but it wasn't just that. We actually have a new piece out today that showed that they were actively spreading disinformation. They were doing psychological operations and that they were considering a much more sweeping program that actually included, and they described in their plans, debanking, which of course we saw Justin Trudeau wow. in Canada wow. use against the truckers. So we're starting to identify what's really a Five Eyes collaboration between the US, Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, where you see these intelligence and security agencies working together to go from counterterrorism last decade to counter populism, trying to counteract the, the supposed threat of populists like we saw with Brexit and the election of Trump in 2016. So now understanding the time frame of this, I'm almost wondering, did Obama recruit Harry when he was at Kensington Palace in 2017? Here's the famous tweet. Good to see my friend Prince Harry in London to discuss the work of our foundations. Now, when you take that into consideration and then fast forward to September to the Invictus Games and you see Biden and Jill Biden and Obama all sitting there with Harry during this Invictus Games in September 2017, Harry did this interview with Obama. And it was released then after Harry's engagement in December of 2017. But there were certain things that I pulled from this interview that I find extremely alarming at the same time indicative of what the mission was that Harry was on over the last couple of years. I think the reason why we've seen everything die down was because in the height of all of it, they were called over here to affect change for the elections, as well as affect change for the online space, which is what he has been doing. These are things that Obama talked about in this interview. Yeah. I mean, you, you managed to get people to use technology to take real action when you were elected um, all that time ago. Yeah. Um, I will, part of me wants to ask how you manage that, but at the same time, I think what I will do is Social media, the, so, the social media landscape has changed yeah, dramatically has. Um, since then. Uh, issues of trolling, extre extremism, fake news, and cyberbullying are yeah. major social issues. Right. Is there is there more that you could have done as president to get ahead of some of these issues? Do you think? Well, most of this is happening in the outside of government, and in the United States in particular, uh, we have a very strong First Amendment. Uh, I am a as a former constitutional lawyer, pretty firm about uh, the merits of uh, free speech. And the, the question, I think, really has to do with how do we harness this technology in a way that allows a multiplicity of voices, allows a diversity of views, but doesn't lead to a balkanization of our society, but rather continues to promote ways of finding common ground. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure government can legislate that, mm -hmm. but what I do believe is that all of us in leadership have to find ways in which we can recreate a common space on the internet. Because it used to be in the United States, at least, for example, we had three television stations and everybody watched Walter Cronkite or David Brinkley or whoever the chief anchor was. Everybody had a common set of facts. Uh, and so there might be conservatives and liberals, but people generally could agree on, on a baseline of reality. Mm -hmm. One of the, the dangers of the Internet is, is that people can have entirely different realities. They can be just cocooned in yep. information that re reinforces their current biases. One of the things that I think I discovered even back in 2007, 2008, is 
a good way of fighting against that is making sure that online communities don't just stay online, that they move offline. Mm -hmm. and, and what I mean by that is that I think the social media is a really powerful tool for people of common interests to convene and get to know each other and connect. But then it's important for them to get offline, mm -hmm. meet, meet in a pub. Get out into <laughs> meet, the community. You know, yeah. Meet, meet it at, a, at a place of worship, mm -hmm. meet in a neighborhood, and get to know each other. Because the truth is, is that on the Internet, everything is simplified. And when you meet people face to face, it turns out they're complicated. You know, there may be somebody who you think is diametrically opposed to you when it comes to their political views, but you root for the same sports team, or you notice that they're really good parents, and that's something that you as a parent care about. And debating it's important. And and you find areas of common ground because you see that things aren't as simple as have, have been portrayed in whatever chat room you've been in. Mm. And one of the things we want to do, I think, is as we're working with young people to build up platforms for social change, make sure that they don't think just sending out a hashtag in and of itself is bringing about change. It can be a powerful way to raise awareness, but then you have to get on the ground and you actually have to do something. This is exactly what, this is exactly what I ended up saying in, uh, in the We Day speech in front of 18,000 kids uh, in the Air Canada Centre yeah. yesterday, was we, we get we get it. We get that uh, a lot of you are hooked on social media, right. but the important thing is that by liking something and sharing something isn't take, isn't no. actually <laughs> making change. change. Right. If you if you really want to make change, you need to look up from your phone. You need to get out into your communities, and you need to stand up for what you believe exactly. in. Um, we can't be the older generation going no to social media. It's bad for you. It's uh, bad for your well, mental that's, health. That's hopeless. It's, it's hopeless. It's a tool, yeah. and used managed correctly, it can be it powerful. has an amazing power. That's so exactly right. you know, on the social media front, educate or regulate. Yeah. yeah. You said it right there. Educate or regulate. To me, I'm starting to get this feeling that Harry was brought over here on a mission, and I think with the blessing of the institution. I don't think any of this was by accident in regards to the time frame as to what they were doing over here during the lead up to the election, as well as participation with the censorship industrial complex. And then let's not forget on Harry and Meghan's side, they had Genevieve Roth, who worked for the Obama Foundation or was a part of Obama's campaign. You look back at all that Meghan and Harry had done and the royal family did absolutely nothing to shut it down means to some degree they knew what they were doing over here, especially since Harry has been left on that website indicating that he's still serving the crown. Now, I'm going to end on this final note. I think we're beyond the WEF and the UN and the WHO in what they have been doing is conspiracy theory. You see it with your own eyes. You hear it with your own ears. There's plenty of information online that you can read for yourself in order to come to your own conclusion. From what this looks like, I don't want my inalienable rights taken away, and I don't want them telling us that we have to change our constitution and you know, remove the freedoms that we have, especially having this prince here who is literally trying to undermine our rights. To me, that's a bad thing. And I'm sorry, but I don't believe that King Charles is removed from all of this. He was just at COP28 telling the world that we have to sink in $5 trillion for this climate change nonsense that they keep forcing and instilling fear into us about the world ending. They're not anywhere near where they're supposed to be. And, you know, quite frankly, some of these SDG goals set out by the UN that the Prince's Trust is following to a T. We'll get into that in another video. But quite frankly, they could be solving world hunger and ending poverty with all the ungodly amount of money from these elites that could pitch in a trillion or two here and there. We really could be out of this. but. They choose not to. So ask yourself this question, why? Why won't they do it? Anyhow, I'll leave you on that note. Lots to think about here. I will be breaking down some more stuff that does tie 
Harry and Meghan's alignment with our election and what they have been doing with this nonprofit as the front in order to literally interfere and, you know, sabotage. That's what exactly what Meghan and I have been doing, sabotaging our politics. So let me know your thoughts. I know this was a lot to take in. It's just me thinking out loud. This is pure opinion, all speculative, of course. But, you know, when you put all these facts together and you join the dots and you recognize what has happened over the last six years, I don't think the monarchy would allow this to be seen as mistakes upon mistakes upon mistakes. I think there was deliberate intention with a lot of this stuff, and they knew to some degree what was going on. Anyhow, definitely let me know your thoughts. As always, I will be back with more content, but until then, please be safe, and I'll talk to you later. Bye! It was such a broad. <laughs>